here's what we're, what we're going to be covering here in lesson number six, which is all about culture. Uh, we're going to be talking about experiment number one, how to build a culture of competitive greatness by identifying core values. Experiment number two, we're going to talk about how to avoid the tax man. 1099 contractors versus W2 employees. Experiment number three, how to create a team of owners, hourly pay versus commission pay. So experiment number one, how to build a culture of competitive greatness by identifying core values. And man, I learned this lesson the hard way. And it was one day Katie was sitting across the kitchen table from me and uh, she had tears in her eyes. And I just like had that feeling inside of me that she had, she had something to share and I knew, I knew it wasn't good. I could tell something was eating her up and I pressed her, right? I don't, I don't shy away from those conversations and uh, those that like, those like that slight tear, it escalated into a confession. She told me she wanted to shut down the cleaning company. Now, this wasn't the first time that she told me that she wanted to shut down the cleaning company, but this time I could tell, like, she said it with conviction. Like, she was like, I do not want to be part of this anymore. <laughs> and the reason was because that morning we had uh, woke up and we had six cleaning techs on our team and we were making progress and things were moving right along. And then by the end of that day, uh, we only had two. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was very frustrating. And the frustration it 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 started out by us directing it outward right we, at first we looked outward and we were blaming the cleaners we blamed um the group of people who who left us again high and dry uh, we started to blame them and we wanted to escape and i like like i'm sure that some of these feelings might feel familiar um but we let time pass and the further we got away from that moment, additional options began to appear. And instead of looking outward and blaming, we started looking inward. And we realized that it wasn't the four cleaners who were the problem, it was us. We were just hiring warm bodies. Anybody we could get to work for us and that they could, they could work a vacuum and they could work a mop, like they were in, right? We hired quickly. And so why were we surprised when they exited just as quick? So instead of deciding to quit, we did make a decision to build something that lasts, to change how we did things, because what we did before was clearly not working. And so we, at that moment, we had an opportunity and we took it to design a culture of greatness right at that point we had nothing to lose we're starting back almost at square one again like, why don't we just do something that's cool right why don't we just build an army like who would actually die for the mission why don't we actually create a standard of what this company stands for and how we do business and it starts with us holding ourselves to the standard and then we can hold everybody else to that standard as well and like most things that are good, it wasn't going to be easy. But the question was, would be worth it? And so we decided it was worth it. And it was in that moment that we decided to design our culture and we decided to design this company. And because of that, like in this moment right now, we have 12 full-time cleaners. Right. We have one full-time salesperson. We have three full-time office staff. And our revenue went from at that moment doing about $20,000 a month to again, now we're doing about $70,000 a month. And we're netting about 25 to 30%. You wanna know how? Because we built this culture of competitive greatness. And so there were six big changes that we implemented in that moment. So I know, you, I know the answer to this, but are you guys interested in seeing those six changes. Can we get some thumbs up? Can we get some, can we get the chat going here? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's do it. So number one, mission, right? We actually created a mission. Like what is our company doing? What does it stand for? Why are we in business? And what we came up with is like our mission is to provide a consistent, cleaning experience for the Bozeman community through our fast communication 
and ability to act quickly. Right? That's our mission. The next thing that we created were core values. Right? And so these core values, we've actually iterated these core values many, many times. Right? And so this is not our first draft. This is more like our 10th draft. And so right now our core values are consistent, service, communication, flexible, accountable, growing, and integrity. Right? Those seven core values is what we look for. And that's what we are. And so that's what we look for and people who we bring on to our company. Right. And so anytime we're in any sort of situation and we don't, we're not sure of the answers, we look to these as being our foundation in those. When we get great questions, these core values give us a clear answer. We create what I call a mascot. So if you guys have ever been part of a sports team or you guys have a favorite sports team, like every team has a mascot, right? Whether it's professional football, let's say you like the Green Bay Packers, let's say like the Denver Broncos, right? And you become a Broncos fan, you become a Packers fan. Maybe you like basketball. Maybe you like the Chicago Bulls. Maybe you like the Los Angeles Lakers. Or maybe if we look at an example of schools, right? So every single one of you guys went to a school right? Whether it's a high school, whether it's a college. And so like I went to Montana State University, our mascot was the Bobcats. And so thinking about that is like when you identify like, oh yeah, I'm a Bobcat fan. And so when we took that concept and we put it into our cleaning business and we, we created what's called the sparkle bosses, right? So all the people who come onto our team, they're sparkle bosses. And we create a sparkle boss. And so being able to create an identity that someone can, they can like take themselves and they can say okay well maybe i'm not as consistent as i'd like to be maybe i am not as flexible and adaptable in my previous life or in my in my real life but when i'm in my when i'm working as a cleaner when i'm on shift all of a sudden i show integrity i show consistency right i'm, I'm able to identify as a different person when i'm in this lane and so that has been really powerful because it gives people an opportunity to change and to grow because at the end of the day it's like that's what we're all about about change about changing and growing and so finding a mascot and that people can identify with and call themselves that is really powerful and then we created a manifesto right so this manifesto it adds it adds a second element of when you create your when you create your mascot and it weaves in the core values and someone can take this and be like okay again you can use this as an opportunity to get people inspired you can use it as when somebody's out in the field and make and they and they make a mistake per se and you say okay well, what would a sparkle boss do in this situation? How would a sparkle boss fix this situation, right? And so instead of you feeling like, like you're a micromanager, you can say, what would a sparkle boss do? Well, a sparkle boss would take 100% ownership, right? So the moment that you have a, you have a, a tech that starts to blame, it's like, hey, like, would a sparkle boss blame this in this situation? Or would a sparkle boss take ownership in the situation, right? And so you're able to use it as, as a coaching mechanism. And you're able to, again, you're able to help somebody grow without pointing fingers at them. So it helps you as a coach and it helps them as, as somebody who's receiving feedback. Okay. So the manifesto can be inspiring. It can also be a great tool for you to use as coaching. And this is one of my favorite quotes. This is actually by my boy, Alex. And he said, we need to be reminded more than we need to be taught. So a lot of times it's not about doing new and shiny things. It's just doing the boring work over and over and over again. And so you guys have all heard about missions. You guys have all heard about core values, right? You guys have all heard potentially about mascots and, and manifestos, okay? However, this is the key right here, okay? It starts when someone first interacts with your company. And so on our job description, when somebody applies to work for us, like you'll see it on here, like it shows what, are we looking for we're looking for somebody who's consistent we're looking for someone who's service-based someone who's got who's got good communication skills someone who's flexible someone's accountable someone's growing someone's, someone who's got integrity like we show that from right from the very beginning and so we attract people who are drawn into that and we repel so many people who are like oh my gosh like all right this this company sounds like they want me to actually work they actually want me to grow they actually want me to reach my potential right and so that pushes a lot of people away but the, the person who's attracted to that is like oh my gosh i don't see this when I apply for other jobs, like this is really, really cool. And all of a sudden it becomes an opportunity. Okay. So it starts with the job application, but it doesn't stop there, right? That's just the beginning. And so as soon as somebody says, okay, I want to apply, then we send them an application and guess what? 
we talk about core values again on the application. So what is your primary core value? What does reliable being mean to you, right? And so again, we start to we continue to talk about core values on the application. And then when we're actually interviewing them, guess what we talk about? Talk about integrity. We talk about our core values, right? We talk about flexible, right? We talk about communication. Again, we weave these into the interview process because now we know what we're looking for. We're looking for somebody who embodies these core values. Then they accept the position and we send them paperwork. We send them for ours documents. We send them uh, the employee non-compete. We send them the handbook, insider handbook. Guess what we talk about? We talk about the core values. So they see it again, okay? So back to what I talked about before. We need to be reminded more than we need to be taught new things. We have team meetings. When we have team meetings, guess what they see? They see the core values, right? They see that we're consistent. They see that we're service-based. They see we're, that we love, that we can, communicate they see that we're flexible or accountable we grow we have integrity okay they see these things every time we have a team meeting they also see the mission statement they also see the manifesto right these are important things that we're constantly constantly driving these things in when we have one-on-one -on -one meetings with our with our with our sparkle bosses and our team right here's a really cool framework that we, that we work through like we talk about wins we talk about struggles we talk about goals okay we're actually pouring into them and so these one-on-ones are one of the most important things you can do with your cleaning techs that you'll do with your salespeople that you'll do with your recruiter. What it shows, it shows that you're coaching them. So as you're pouring into them and when you're able to actually pour into somebody, they can grow and they feel like they're part of something bigger than just a position than just a job. Okay. So this is another great way to build cultures. Actually, how one ones like get to know them. Right. And it's not, a, it's not like, let me tell you about how my weekend was, but like, what are you working on? What books are you reading? Like, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing to grow your income? Like, you were making this much money. You told me you wanted to, like, you, you, you were making six or $700 a week. You told me you wanted to be making eight, nine hundred, a thousand dollars a week. Like, what's going on? Right? So it's your opportunity to hold someone accountable, to show them love. Okay. One on one meetings, so important. So, another thing that we do, okay, is we do scorecards. So, scorecards give the, the cleaning technicians, gives them opportunity to see exactly how they're doing. Right. And so, we show them what makes a five star cleaner. Okay, we want them to do, we want them to have the opportunity to work at least 28 hours every single week. That to us, like, that's like the bottom end of what we consider somebody who is full time. Okay, they show for all their cleans, right? So if they call out or they say they can't make their clean and it's, and it's less than seven days without giving us notice, like, that's a no no, right? You get docked for that. Like, that shows that you're not reliable. It shows that you're, you're not a person of integrity. Okay, if you have client complaints or correction claims, okay. Obviously, like when you, when you, when you have those things, like, like something isn't, you didn't follow something part of the process. Okay. Or you went too fast or you weren't, you weren't detailed enough. Okay. Teamwork and communication. Like these, these wrap up the, the five things that we share with the, with the cleaners every single week. We give them these scorecards and they see every single week that they are a four out of five or they're a three out of five or they're a five out of five. Right. So they know exactly how they're doing. And so we show them love through accountability saying, we expect greatness out of you. And right now you're not being great. And so if we have people who are constantly in those twos, threes out of fives, we're talking about those in the one-on-ones, like what's going on? Like, why are you calling out so much? Like, why are you getting so many correction phones, right? How come you're not communicating in the WhatsApp thread, right? Why aren't you getting full-time hours? So this is where all these things kind of get weaved in together. But the biggest thing you're missing out on when it comes to building culture of competitive greatness is simply just holding people accountable to what they said they were going to do, right? to having a standard in your business that you actually care for people enough to have a direct conversation to say, you know what, I think you can do better. And I, and I, and I say that out of pure love. And I say that based on data as well. Not just like, I, I feel like you should do better, but like based on the actual data, like you're only a three out of five. Like, why aren't you a five out of five? Okay. So scorecards are a big one. And then last one, this one um, is giving people purpose right and so when you give people purpose outside of just cleaning like like we serve clients at such a high level that we don't even realize it right like the fact that someone can come home from work or even when they're even if they are at home maybe doing work or if they're just at home um and they're getting their house clean and like they don't have to do anything like that is so valuable like people it makes people feel so good right it makes like people's physical space it has a big impact of what they feel up here. And so that's very, very valuable. And then when you partner and you, and you, and you uh, take the next level and you do something like 
what Clean for a Reason is, which is basically us partnering with a company who we clean cancer patients' homes for free. Um, it makes the cleaners like really inspired. It's like our company stands for more than just making money, right? And so if you guys aren't familiar with with Cleaning for a Reason, it is a a charity where us as the cleaning company, we part we partner with Cleaning for a Reason. And then somebody who is in our community who is dealing with any sort of cancer, they can reach out to Cleaning for a Reason, they can apply, and then we will go and we will clean their home for free. And we will do two cleans. Um one month apart and yeah that and that service is 100 pro bono so us as the cleaning company like we eat that cost our cleaners get paid our clients their homes get clean and so that's just part of our charitable um giving back to our community and ultimately though what it does from a from a culture standpoint is that it, it shows the it shows the cleaners that we're actually doing something really cool we're doing something more than just cleaning houses right we like we stand for something bigger, and I'll, and I'll tell you what. How many people mention that like they they love working for us because that we do this partnership with cleaning for a reason? How much it impacts them? Like they just like and, and they love telling their their friends and their family members when they go actually do a cleaning for a reason um, house. Like it's so impactful on the person who cleans the house and all and also the person who gets the cleaning. So another great way to to build culture is again stand for something doesn't necessarily have to be i think for a reason but if you're doing something for the community you're doing something bigger than just like making money man it, it's a great way to build your team so those are the six reasons so if you guys got value from that let me know but again like it's really simple but it's about doing the basics consistently okay so if, if you guys got value from that let me know let's see it i got the chat open here not moving on until I get a until I get that chat rock and rolling. So yeah, love it. Cool. All right, guys. Okay. So those six so important. Let's move on to framework number two. Okay. So I, I call this one avoid the tax man. Ten million contractors with W two employees. I think this is one of the most common questions I get when people are uh in the cleaning business they're like what should i do <laughs> so i'll tell you i'll tell you where this where the first like my first thought that always comes up when someone asks me this question and it was uh what i was i was actually 27 years old right i was like two or three years into starting my gym business and i was very optimistic yet i was a very naive entrepreneur <laughs> and i trained a client um, his name was Cliff and he was a super successful businessman and he saw that I was naive, I think more than anything, but I was also hungry and I would ask him so many questions and, um, I think he loved me for that. And so I trained him twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 9am did that for so many years. And, uh, yeah, like yeah, he, he saw I was hungry. So I was curious. I always asked questions. I always listened to what he said and I, I implemented everything. I just, I just was like, I was a sponge. And so I think because of that, he chose to pour into me, even though I didn't have much to offer other than uh, I was his personal trainer, right? But those sessions were definitely more BS sessions than they were workout sessions. Uh, <laughs> but I feel very fortunate because I got paid to learn business lessons twice a week. I was like, wow, like, I feel like this is, I feel like this is cheating. <laughs> and uh, he, he used to kind of say the same thing. He said, you know, for as much as I'm paying you, like, you should be the one who's doing the work and I should be the one telling you what to do. <laughs> So I was very, very lucky in that aspect. But um, so when I decided to hire my first employee, my first employee, I, I asked Cliff's advice, right? And I shared him my, my game plan to bring my first staff member. And I remember after asking him, because I was like, like, dude, I think like this is a great idea. I thought through everything I could think of. And he's like, yeah, Logan, do you know what happens if the government deems that your 1099 employee is in fact, should be classified as a W-2 employee? <laughs> That's how I used to talk. Uh, I was like, no, I, I have no idea. And uh, it was in one of those training sessions that I I learned a really powerful lesson. Uh, and I think some lessons you gotta learn the hard way. And this one, um, I'm grateful that I didn't ever have to learn the hard way. And so he told me about one of his friends. His, his and his friend's name was let's call him Jim. I'm not gonna share his his real name, but let's call him Jim here. And so Jim owned a welding shop. Right. And so 
he was the owner, he was the manager, he was the welder for three years, right? Um, he, he did everything. But um, once the word started getting out about, about Jim's work, like the phone started to ring, right? And so Jim did what every entrepreneur does. So he started, he hired office staff, right? That's generally the easiest hire for all of us. We just hire an office person or a virtual assistant uh, to help him with the phone calls. And so after that though, his phone's still ringing and he hired his first welding technician. Um, when he could no longer handle all the actual work himself. But that welding technician, it was an employee, right? Jim had convinced the, uh, his, first, his first guy that uh, being a 1099 contractor, it was best, right? He would make more money and he would have to pay social security taxes and like, you know, just, it was great. It would be so much better for both of them. And so for the next couple of years, like Jim killed it, man. Like he had to hire three more welders, and the business was growing. And so Jim began hiring office managers and his touch points with his original staff had kept on decreasing as he started to scale out of his business, right? So good for Jim, right? That's what you're supposed to do in your business, you're supposed to scale out. Jim, Jim was making it. <laughs> he had a gatekeeper, right? He finally had a person who was like hiring and firing, communicating with his, with the staff, both new and old. But not everyone was on board with all these changes, right? And so Jim's first welding technician, he wasn't. So he decided to quit. And so days later, that welding technician went down to the Department of Labor to file for his unemployment. Well, there was two problems. The first problem was that, well, you're not eligible for unemployment when you quit. That's, that's the first thing, right? Like everyone knows that. The second thing is like, you're uneligible for unemployment as a 1099 contractor. Well, the, the welder got frustrated and he felt that Jim had duped him, right? And so guess what this welding technician did? He lawyered up, right? He lawyered up because he felt like he should be able to get unemployment even though he quit and even though he wasn't a W-2 employee. Well, after a year investigation, guess what happened? The state actually decided that the welder was misclassified. And so the results? Well, the welder actually got unemployment, right? Even though he quit, it doesn't make sense, but apparently because he was misclassified, they gave him unemployment. And you know what Jim got? Jim got a $100,000 tax bill, right? For all those taxes that he hadn't been paying over the last couple of years. And so not only did that happen, but then they, after the investigation, they did a full audit of Jim's company and they found that he had done this not just with one of his willing technicians, but he'd done it with all of them. And so, as you guys could probably assume, um, yeah, Jim had a file bankruptcy. He had, overnight, he had a successful business that got bankrupt because he made one simple decision. Jim no longer has a business. And honestly, guys, here's actually the worst part. Jim has to pay those, those taxes still. So, the lesson, the tax man always gets his money, right? Even if you don't have a business. So, when I started my... My cleaning business, I remember the story. <laughs> and so I wrote down all the pros and cons list of 1099 versus W2 because I still wanted to put it on paper. That way I could continue to sell myself that, you know what? What are the chances that the state's actually gonna audit me and they're gonna come look at my business? Maybe it's maybe it's it's slim to none, but like, is it actually worth it? And so I just put down a pros and cons list. So here is my pros and cons list when I started this cleaning company is I put all the 1099 contractor pros. And here are the pros is that you don't have to train them, right? Because they're coming already, um, they already have cleaning experience because you're going after other smaller, maybe solopreneurs. You don't have to micromanage them, right? You don't have to, you don't have to file or you don't have to pay for unemployment insurance. You don't have to pay for liability insurance because your contractor is going to hold their own insurance. You don't have to do bond insurance. You don't have to pay for workman's compensation. You don't, you don't have to do, you don't have to have a payroll service. And you have to pay the FICA taxes. Okay, right? I, I see why people want to do 1099s, right? Just from right there. But obviously there's cons, right? And so one of the cons, or a couple of the cons I saw with, being, with having 1099s is that you don't have control of their schedule, right? That there is no team meetings. Um, technically, the contractor owns that relationship with the client, right? Um, you don't have control over the service, the fulfillment. So if they do a good or bad job, 
even if you're the one who's selling it and somebody else is fulfilling it, guess who's holding the bag if they want a refund or they want to, or they want to pay for it, right? And you just get a smaller applicant pool because when people want to become cleaners, like if you try to expect them to also have to manage their own bookkeeping and taxes and insurance and, and all that other stuff, you're definitely going to lose a lot of people, right? And let's just say that you do all those things above, right? Let's say that you have a 1099 employee, as I call them. And so you control their schedule, you put them on team meetings, you have a relationship. Uh, you, you basically, again, you just treat them like they're a 1099 contractor from a pay standpoint, but you treat them as a W-2 employee from a, from a, a, um, a, a culture standpoint. Well, now you're in jeopardy of actually owing those back taxes, right? And so to me, that never made sense. The risk was way too much for, for me. So then I wrote down the W-2 pros, right? So the W-2 pros is that you have the largest applicant pool, right? Which means that anybody who is a cleaner, even who's not a cleaner, um, they could apply for this position. And I didn't have to worry about them not understanding how to file for their, or how to do their own taxes, make sure that they were bonded and insured. Like they could just show up, I could take care of all that stuff for them. Okay. I could actually train them. So I could teach somebody who had zero cleaning experience how to actually train. I could control their schedule. I could tell them where to be, when to be there. Okay? I could offer them benefits, right? I could actually say, hey, I'm going to give you dental insurance. I'm going to give you supplemental health insurance. I'm going to give you paid time off, okay? I could actually keep that relationship with a client, right? Which to me, you guys have watched any of my other trainings, you'll know that like, I think the value in this business is the relationship with a client because you can sell a client once and you can keep them for years, right? So I get to keep that client relationship strong. And I could do team meetings, Right. So those are all the pros that I saw with having a W-2 employees. W-2 cons, right? You got to pay FICA taxes, right? Which means that not only you got to pay them their wage, but you also got to pay for their social, you got to pay half their social security, you got to pay half of their state and federal and unemployment and um, what else goes into there, right? I don't even remember. There's lots of other ones that go in there too, right? Workman's compensation, right? So, and then you always got to have a payroll service as well. So those are the cons of having 1099 versus W-2, but with all that being said, like to me, it, it makes the most sense. And you guys can see, I have a little typo right there, but uh, to me, it just made more sense and made it safer that if I'm gonna make money, I'm gonna have my business that's crushing it. I don't wanna just wake up one day and it all go away, right? So what I did is I actually put together this pros and cons list on one, um, on one Google doc. So if you guys are interested in having that, you guys, again, you guys can make your own decision, I trust the means, but uh, you guys obviously know which way that I lean on this, but if you guys want that pros and cons list, let me know. And uh, once you guys get access to this recording and this training, you guys can have access to that sheet. So that's sound cool to you guys. You guys cool with that? And just and just out of curiosity, based on that on that pitch, what are you guys what are you guys thinking? You, you guys still like the tenant contractors? You guys you like the W two employees? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 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 All right, guys, let's talk about framework number three. So this is one of my favorite ones as well. And uh, this is how you create a team of owners, okay? Hourly pay versus commission pay. So when we first got into the cleaning business, I was like genuinely curious. Again, I had never ran a cleaning business. I was never a cleaner. And so I was like, do we actually have to pay for drive time? <laughs> I was like, when do the cleaners clock in? Do they clock in like at the office? Do they clock in at, when they get to the house? Do they clock in when they're in the driveway of the house? I was just like, huh, I don't know. Uh, so these are some of the questions I remember asking myself when we first started a cleaning company. And so with no clear answer, I just, I just trusted my intuition, really. And so we started out by paying our cleaning techs by the hour. And we didn't pay for gas or mileage. Um, but we did allow them to keep 90% of the tips. And then we actually had the remaining 10% go to the office staff, right? So that's how we started out. And so our cleaners were paid. They are paid okay, right? But following on that heels, the mass exodus of our four cleaners that I talked about earlier, that those four techs cleaning or those four techs quitting in the same day, um, I realized that, again, part of this problem was that our pay was low and our turnover was high, right? And so what we were doing, again, obviously wasn't working. So, again, it gave us an opportunity to build this team with attention, with competitive greatness, right? And we talked about earlier. A big portion of that was just us having clarity on who we're bringing on the team. But another big portion of that was like being able to offer 
great wages for great people, right? That's how you that's how you create great people is you create an opportunity for them that is big enough for what they feel like they are like they, they, they can be part of for a long period of time. And so great workers don't work in average opportunities, at least not for long. Okay. And so my whole thought process was like, how do we turn an average job into a great opportunity? Like, that was always my thought process. Like, if I could do that, man, we could blow this thing up. And so that was my first step. Like, how do we just pay people great? And we searched for years and years and thousands of dollars. We spent on mentorships and courses and looking for things. And we finally found the solution. And it was called Empowerment Pay, right? And so Empowerment Pay, like it gave our cleaners an opportunity that they legitimately could not get anywhere else to control their financial destiny, okay? They actually got paid like sales, like a salesperson without having to talk to anybody, without having to do any calls, without having to do, overcome any objections, to have any sales training. They could legitimately get paid like a salesperson. I was like, wow, like, this is actually pretty cool. Uh, and they get compensated like an owner. Right? So they, they could take a percentage of the revenue that they were bringing in. That's pretty cool as well. Like that, that fits right with our culture. And so the results, well, our cleaners' paychecks doubled, right? And applicants for clean technicians doubled as well when we were able to share what we were offering these clean techs um, who came in and they're like, wow, like I can make double here where I can make anywhere else. That sounds really cool. And it was actually. I mean, at the time it wasn't as funny, but now looking back on it, it was it's like, it's kind of funny. Like we had ascended one of our cleaners into an office manager position. And then we went to this empower pay. She was like, huh, I think I'm going to go back into the field. I, I see how much these other cleaners are making. Like I can make more money in the field than I can being office manager. <laughs> like, Dang it. But uh, that's, that's, that's part of the game, I guess. And so our payroll did double, right? It definitely doubled, but so did our profits. And this reason was because we had happier cleaners, which meant that we had happier clients. And happier cleaners stay longer and equals less turnover cost. So again, we could either pay the cleaners more or we could just pay more to Indeed. We could pay more to our to train people uh, or we could just pay our cleaners more. Either way, we're gonna pay. And happier clients stay longer. And when you have happier clients, they stay longer and then they have, we have a longer lifetime value. And so when we get a client and we have happy cleaners, happy clients, business is just happier and just better, right? And so never again, do we have to worry about cleaners milk on the clock right? or trying to take advantage of us. Instead, we're focused on teaching our cleaners what to do with all the money they're making. <laughs> this is now a problem. And so same thing that I did earlier, but I created a pros and cons list versus hourly versus empowerment pay, right? And by doing this, I just got to see side by side which one of these was better. So hourly pros, right? Hourly pros, simple, easy to understand, right? You get the largest applicant pool. Like most people understand hourly pay, right? Payroll becomes really, really simple. So those are the pros of keep, keeping your cleaning techs hourly or hiring your cleaning taxes hourly. Here's some of the cons, is that they can milk the clock, right? And every time that they're milking the clock, like you only have a set amount of money that you're charging the client, but if a cleaner is there for an hour, um, you know, then you pay them for an hour, but if they're there for two hours, you pay them for two hours, but the revenue doesn't change. You also usually have to pay extra for, for mileage and pay extra for gas. Uh, we didn't do that, but I see when I'm in part of these other groups that most people, they do pay extra for mileage, they do pay extra for gas, right? And so at that point, accounting becomes a, becomes a big problem. I didn't put that on there, but like now all of a sudden you have so many different numbers you have to track and you're paying your hourly wage and you're also paying mileage, you're paying, you're paying uh, gas time, you're also doing tips as well probably. And so all that becomes more complicated. So your, your payroll becomes a lot more complicated just by simply doing this, right? Empowerment paid pros, number one, unlimited earning potential. So when you're able to sell that to somebody who's coming into a entry-level position, that's like, wow, that's pretty cool, right? And it's all based on them just showing up and working hard, which anybody can do. Again, it's not a skill set of selling. It's not a skill set of marketing. It is literally just, can you show up and can you do a great job while you have a vacuum or a mop in your hand, 
right? Like to me, I think that's so powerful. It breeds entrepreneurship. And so again, if we're building this company of people who are act like owners, like you want to give people the opportunity to do that, like entrepreneurship is the way to do that, which means that they have the ability to make as much money as they want. They like the more that they work, the more they get paid, right? And one of the other reasons I really like retirement pay is that it protects the margins. So you're paying them a fixed revenue split, which means that if you charge the client 200 and they and and they get their their percentage, like it scales up and down based on what you charge the client. And so even if they're there for an hour or two hours, what they get paid is the same. Okay. Just whatever we charge the client. And it also means that if the client doesn't pay because they don't like the service, because they had a because there was a complaint, guess what? That affects the cleaner as well. And so they're incentivized also to do a great job. So while they have all the upside of being able to earn a lot of money, they also have the extra responsibility that if they don't do a good job or they have to go back and fix it, you know, that they're not getting paid any more for that. So that is really nice. And ultimately all that does is it protects the margins. Now, here's some of the cons is they definitely get a small applicant pool because people generally don't understand commission. They definitely don't understand empowerment pay. This is why we're having a presentation on it right now. Uh, there also is additional responsibility, which you can look at that as a negative thing, but for the right type of person, the person who is drawn into your ads, they really like that, right? Because again, most people who vibe with our culture like that additional responsibility. But again, from a, from a general basis, like it is extra responsibility and you definitely get a small applicant pool when you do empowerment pay. Oops. So what is empowerment pay, right? And so empowerment pay is really simple, is that based on three tiers, the cleaners get three different commission, get, um, get to take three different percentages of the total revenue that they produced, okay? And so you guys can see down there, we have tier one. So anyone who works less than 28 hours in a week, they're in tier one, and they'll get 30% of the revenue that they produce. In tier two, anywhere from 28 to 34 hours, they're getting 38% of the revenue they produce. And then when they're in tier three, which is 34 plus hours, they're getting 43% of the revenue that they produce. Okay. So here's an example. So let's say a cleaner produces $1,625 in revenue and they're working 25 hours, okay? So this is calculated at $55 per job ticket hour, which is, or excuse me, $65 a job ticket hour, which is what we correlate most of our cleans to, right? So if they work 25 hours, they're making $487 this week. Now, let's say that they go to tier two and they're able to get to, they're able to work 30 hours, okay? And so based on that 1950 revenue, Again, which is based on $65 for a job ticket hour, they're going to make $741. Now, let's say that they work 35 hours, and so they produce $2,227 for the company, and so now they're getting paid $978 a week. So by simply working 10 more hours, look how much more money they make, almost double. How cool is that? Now, put your guys' butts in this seat, and how many of you guys are incentivized to actually try to work 35 hours versus working 25 hours. Yeah? That sound cool to you guys? And so the reason why this works is because as a cleaning company, the more that your cleaners work, the more profitable they become, and the less call-outs that you have, the less rescheduling they have, um, like you're able to make a lot more money. And so here's an example of a week of our cleaners, right? And so you can see here, again, this is like, this is real data. This was, where is this from? So this was from January of 23. And so these are our cleaners right here. You see that someone made $458, someone made $730, someone made $1,300, um, $600, 970, 44, 806, 522, 428, 880, $1,100. Someone made 131. Also, this is a, this is a trainer. So you can see, you can see the trainer here. You can see the tiers that they're in, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, one more on here. Okay, so here's a second one here. So this one is from February. Um, yeah, so someone made seven hundred forty-three dollars. Someone made twelve hundred dollars. Someone made thousand dollars. Five eighty-three, eight thirteen, eleven hundred, nine seventy-one, three eighty-five, um, thousand twenty-four, and thousand forty-four. There's five people who made over a thousand dollars, and this is per week, per week. 
right? So tell me a position that you can offer somebody where they can make starting $1,000 per week take home. Pretty cool opportunity, right? So, um, and again, you see this number right here, you see like every single week we're paying $9,000 in payroll, right? Again, payroll doubles, but so are your profits. Okay, and that's what you gotta understand. If you want to grow a company that runs without you and you want to build a team that embodies competitive greatness, like give them an opportunity to show that they're great by paying them great. That's how you do it. So if you guys want that breakdown, hourly pay versus empowerment pay, this link is gonna be in the slides, okay? And then if you guys want the document on empowerment pay, there's there's a nice cool little video on there too that explains it even um, in in any more in even more detail that's on there as well. So you guys get access to that. So that sound cool with you guys? You guys cool with that? Does anybody in here actually do empowerment pay right now? Yeah, it's awesome, tomorrow. Cool. Empowerment pay is the way to go, man. Like I said, like those numbers, like, like the numbers don't lie. And uh, it's it's a game changer, right? You want to have great people, give them a great opportunity, right? Use money to build your team. That's that's one of the lessons that I, yeah, use money to build your team, right? So who sees the value in building a culture of competitive greatness? Anybody? Yeah. So guys, this is lesson six of eight. We're we're getting close to the end of this masterclass, which is which has been pretty fun. I've I've really enjoyed this. Hopefully you guys have. If you guys haven't gone back and watched the first uh, five on clarity, marketing, sales, recruiting, data was last week and this week, of course, is culture. Uh, like I've been having fun with this. Hopefully you guys have been having fun getting lots of value from this. Um, but you guys actually can you actually see how you actually can build a million dollar fan company like just with this information like are you guys starting to see it now starting to make sense i hope so i hope so right uh i literally thought about this i was like it's like getting a franchise right it's literally like getting a franchise but you don't have to pay twenty five thousand dollars <laughs> or six percent for life <laughs> you get it all you get it you literally get it all for free like i don't know i think that's super cool right so th does anybody else think that's cool that was my that was my epiphany of the day. I was like, people pay a lot of money for this type of like systems and operations. And I don't know, you guys just all get it for free, which is just cool. So, um, yeah. And I think it's funny. I was like, why do I do this? Right. It's, um, and maybe that's even the question that maybe some of you guys said to like, why do you do this? Um, I do it for accountability. So I've told you guys from the very beginning on this, like my number one goal is to build our cleaning company to a million dollars and as I've shared with you guys, we're not there yet. Um, and so I did this as a way to like put it out to the world to have you guys hold me accountable, whether you guys realize it or not. Like every time I do this and I say that we're building a million dollar company, a clean company, we're not there yet. It, uh, it, it eats me up, right? It makes me like, it doesn't eat me up in, in a negative way, but I'm like, I'm very focused and it, it will, it will continue to keep me focused and drive me to make sure that our company is able to fulfill on this promise of building a million dollar cleaning company now. Um, so that's why I do this, right? to hold myself accountable, to tell, tell the world to make sure that I follow through and I end up making this happen, right? One of the other things about teaching, you guys have to do this, is that I learn, right? So I'm like, oh, that's actually why I do this. Every single time that I do one of these presentations, like I spend hours and hours putting these presentations together, putting the documents, putting the PDFs in the right spots, and I learned by teaching. It also helps me organize things as well. It's like, oh, like I need to actually create that document. Like that was one of the things I need to do. I, I need to create an hourly versus an empowerment pay. Like, why do we do the way? Why do we do that? Um, and so I learned by teaching. I also get fulfillment by seeing you guys' success, seeing you guys take action. Um, like someone the other day sent me a message. It's like, dude, like the sales process, it's so good. <laughs> like I just knocking them down. I was like, yeah, that's so cool to see. Right. So, so cool to hear that. Um, and so again, like those things, like they get me excited. And so another thing that I've been thinking about too, is like, how do I scale this? Like I, in my head, I believe that in this thing, we'll be able to turn this into a 
and then do our cleaning business. And then I'm like, how do I scale it? Like, do I start another cleaning company? Do I do a, like a full on uh, course or mentorship, or do I look at acquiring more cleaning companies? And so this is kind of a, kind of a, again, that allows me to kind of feel around and see how I want to scale this thing because I understand how to do it. It's just like, where do I put the information? Where do I package this information to make the most impact and create the biggest value um, that I possibly can? And I'm, learning, I'm starting to have a scale. So that's another reason why I'm doing this as well. And so part of that is doing the decade in the day. And so, um, yeah, decade a day was, is just like taking 10 years of business lessons and like trying to input them into a human being's brain in one day. <laughs> and so my idea behind decade a day was to make sure that the automated marketing funnel is set up, right? Make sure that we have leads coming into the business because if you have no leads, you have no business, right? Make sure that we have a customized sales process, making a process that is just like, it should feel smooth. It should feel good when you get someone on a phone call and you should be like, man, I'm changing this person's life, right? And it should feel just as good for them as it does for you as well, right? And I'm in a recruiting funnel because again, the goal is not just for us to make money. We want to be able to make money and also be able to have a time that we can actually focus on growing rather than having to be in the weeds, whether it's cleaning, whether it's doing uh, office work, or whether it's on the phone, on the phones, selling people or hiring and firing our staff members, right? And so we need to be able to have the automated recruiting funnel as well, right? We need, to, we need to have not only clients coming to the business, but also staff members coming to the business. Culture, right? Again, culture starts with you. And like when you have, if you have a crappy culture, if you have no culture, it's because you didn't build it or you didn't design it intentionally. Some people, they have a culture just because like they have a, like they have a big personality and they have the, they have right intentions, but the more and more people you bring on your team, it gets diluted more and more because you're not the one who's hiring anymore. You're not the one who's talking to the customers anymore. And so when you actually don't have actual structured culture, uh, then you start to wonder why your clients start to complain more. You start to wonder why you start bringing in uh, people who are like not good human beings and you're paying them, right? It doesn't make sense. It's because you don't have a culture. Um, what data do you track, right? There's so many numbers. And one of the epiphanies I had about business in the last couple of years is that business is just a big math problem. Like if you just get the math right from the start, it's pretty hard to mess it up unless you decide to not use the math and you, and you don't analyze the math and you try to make emotional decisions like how I feel or you get your ego in the way. Outside of those variables, like math is business, right? When you understand that, it becomes a really simple game. And so decade a day, it's an in-person experience, right? It's really unique. And I think about it from like, there is nobody else doing this in the, in the, um, like in the mentorship space, because the message is always scale, it's scale, scale, scale. It's like, how do I, how do I do the unscalable things? Or how do I do the scalable things? How do I have a course that a thousand people can see? How do I do a, um, an event where there's thousands of people who can show up? How do I do a zoom call? Like, like, you know, as many people can be on these, on these Zoom calls. And so when I created Decade and Day, I was like, let's do the unscalable thing. Let's do the thing that nobody's doing. Let's get somebody who's hip with you, somebody who can, who can feel your energy, who can smell your breath, right? Somebody who can feel your touch. Um, so that's, that's what, what Decade and a Day is, right? And so I literally just created it for younger me. Right? I was like, what would I want if I was young or new or uh, just getting started in business? I was like, this would be amazing. Right. Like if I could just, if I could just shortcut this process, like sign me up. Right. And so we had our first deck in a day participant last week and it was amazing. And, you know, as, you know, as hopefully helpful as it was for them, like I, I loved it. It was like, I felt, I felt called to be in that setting and it was, it was exciting and uh, man, just super, super blessed, super grateful. And I opened this decade and day opened, I opened it up to five people. Um, and the investment was $10,000, but for the first five people, I gave them a 50% discount. So only $5,000 for the first five people. And as of right now, three of those spots have been taken. Uh, so again, we, we did, we fulfilled one last week and we have the next two weeks, we have um, schedule is full for the next two weeks. 
And so that remains that there's what two people left or there's two spots left. So um, at least get, at least you get that 50% discount anyway. And so again, like this is really only for people who want to go faster and have a personalized experience. Like again, there's so much good information in here that I think you can get um, like just by watching all the trainings, you can get a lot of the ways there, but you definitely want to go faster. You want to have a personalized experience. Like that's what this is for, right? And so the guarantee I make on this one is like, if you don't make your money back at least in six months. Like I will literally write you a check for $5,000. Um, like that's the guarantee. So I put my money where your mouth is. You put your money where your mouth is. You put the work in, like guaranteed you make your money. So, and there's a really cool bonus. Part of the experience is that you get free lodging, right? So you get to come hang out with me. Um, whether you're, whether we're in Montana, whether you're in Arizona, uh, wherever we're at, like I'll house you, whether it's one of our Airbnbs or if our Airbnbs are full, put you in a nice hotel, uh, and then free food, lots of yum yums, um, love to eat, love to eat really good food. So it's all part of, all part of the experience. So yeah, you know, that's something that you're interested in. Definitely take advantage of it. The application is in the slides. I will, uh, I'll drop it in the chat as well, but other than that, just super grateful for all you guys. And um, we'll do a little bit of Q&A here. I got, I got my daughter over here. She's getting bored. She pops, get off, get off this call. Let's, let's do something. But uh, hopefully hopefully you guys got some, some value from this call, even though sitting in a hotel room, I'm not sure. Hopefully the, again, hopefully the, the audio is good and everything is great. So, all right, guys and gals, um, let me go back to the chat here. Uh, all right questions drop your questions in the chat right, there's the application for duck and day okay let me scroll up here awesome tamara tamara is doing a retirement with her yes yeah anytime you're doing any changes too guys like one of the things i've learned is by changing lots of things and in business like it seems like every single week that we change something is letting everybody know as a almost like make it into an idea like hey like i had this and like literally like tell the like I, like tell story if you guys if you guys notice the framework of how i tell any sort of content I always put a story behind it because it, it always gives it meaning like there's a reason why i'm having these conversations it's like hey like i was having this conversation with a business with a cleaning business owner someone who i really respect or whatever the conversation is right and it's like and we talking about this thing called empowerment pain like he showed me the the uh the paychecks of all his cleaners they're making like a thousand dollars a week and it was crazy just blow my mind i was like wow i gotta know more about this and i was like so sort of looking into it I'm like this is so cool i don't really, really know much about it right now but you guys want to make more money <laughs> right and they're like yeah that sounds kind of cool like, okay cool cool well, I just want to check with you guys. Uh, like, if you guys want to make more money, like, I'll look into it a little bit more. And so maybe next, what we're gonna meet again next week, right? So what if I bring something next week and I'll, I'll kind of give you guys um, a little bit more once I learn more about it? That sounds cool with you. Like, yeah, that sounds cool, right? And so it's you playing the long game and you understanding sequence, you understanding steps, and rather than be like, okay, I'm changing you guys' pay. I think you guys are gonna make more money with this, and uh, yeah. So you know, you guys are used to getting paid this way. I'm just gonna change it. Cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, right, and maybe that's that sounds extreme, but that's generally actually how most people do business, right? Because they're the they're the king on the hill, right? And they're and their their employees are just their their peasants or their workers. They're just the ones who're supposed to be told what to do. And I, th I think a lot of that comes from just a wrong way of understanding how the team operates, right? Like you guys are you guys are together, and just because something should be a certain way doesn't mean it is that way um and so the more you can get the buying from your team and the more you can sell them the more that you can make it their idea the more likely they are to be successful so i think that's just always a, a good rule of thumb is that just because you just because the way things again just because you want something to be a certain way or you think it should be a certain way doesn't mean it is that way so okay questions you guys have any questions you guys are light on questions man No questions. Must have done such a great job. All right, Brian's got a question. Good. Looking at the pricing sheet you provided, what is the difference between the residential phone quote pricing, the residential phone quote pricing?
Brian, I'm gonna have you unmute yourself. See if I can get a little more clear on. On your question here. Um, so it's actually Lindsay. He's oh, not. What's up, Lindsay? Sorry. <laughs> He's not here right now. Um, so <clears throat> with the two, there's two different spreadsheets with like, um, like how the pricing is laid out by the square footage and different stuff like that. Um, one specifically says like the residential phone quote pricing and the prices are just a little bit different. So I didn't know if one possibly was just like a newer one and one was an older one. Um, that's kind of where I was going with that. And I just didn't know which one would be more usable. Yep. So the one that you want is the one that I put, actually, I don't think I've actually done the, um, I haven't done the scheduling zoom yet here. That's why I haven't, I have not done the, that's like next week, I think is actually doing like, we're doing a whole thing on scheduling because okay, it's perfect. super valuable, but I no, maybe I did drop the, the estimator in there, right? The, the quote estimator sheet for sales like that actually should have been, a yes. name, but uh, yeah. So I got to find that now. So it should be initial queen. Okay, this is where I, I gotta try to find where everything is here. Which okay, tell me what the top of the of the two sheets say. Like what are they actually called? I'll tell you which one. So it is. the very the the one says the residential phone quote pricing, and it's a little more um like darker colors. Um and then the other one, I don't think it has an actual title, but it says like the TTB Deluxe, empty yes, TTB Deluxe General. Okay, so that's the one we should be using. That's the one. That's the brand new one. Yeah, so that, that's the one that my yes. sales gal. That's what I figured. She, she just created that one. And that's the one she used when she's when she's actually on the calls. Okay, yeah. perfect. That's what I was thinking to myself. And I was like, I'm just going <laughs> to not look at the other, the residential no. focusing one because it's... No, yep. That's I'm one. And <laughs> we're gonna do again. I believe it's next week that we're doing um, that we're doing scheduling. So now we're Perfect. actually gonna make it into scheduling and fulfillment. There's the last last couple of weeks here. So yeah, great question. Awesome. And I, I saw somebody post uh, questions at the group talking about how do they, you know, how do you do that on a sales call? And so like you should have that estimator on on your sales call. Like once somebody agrees to the price, then you then you should have all the questions answered, and you should be able to give them like. Like that's how you create the quote is using that spreadsheet based on their pain points, based on their square footage of their home um, and how many humans are in the house, what their floors are. You basically yeah. get a good idea of what a good quote is over the phone. Yeah, we've um, had a few people come through like, like as a Facebook, because we put the ad out there mm -hmm. for Facebook. And so um, we kind of just put that whole question thing through there and then they've been answering through that. So that's been helpful. Amazing. 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 Yeah. So cool. Okay. Yeah. That's the one to use. Oh, show. Awesome. All right, guys. Any other questions? We got any more questions where you guys, you guys like go, go hang out, go hang out with your kiddo. Lanny, come over here and say hi to everybody. Say hi. You want to say hi? You already know you can't. Okay. Okay. Don't don't come over here. Don't say hi to anybody. All right, guys. Hi. Hi. Right, can't see you. <laughs> say happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Tell them how old you are now. I'm four. 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 And when was your birthday? My 17. <laughs> but I already have to. So we got to wait a whole nother year? And how old are you going to be next year? Uh, five. Sure. Five. Oh my. Five next year. Tell them, tell them when your birthday is again? My 17. But I already have it. Yeah. Well, if, maybe if we tell them the address, maybe they'll send you some presents. <clears throat> That'd be fun. Or maybe just come to your birthday and play with you. How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. More fun, huh? <laughs> All 
All right, guys. Well, hey, I don't see any more questions. So again, I appreciate you guys for, for being on here. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, get into you know, the group if you have any more questions. Other than that, uh, hopefully you guys got some value. Even though the quality of the, uh, the video and the audio were down, hopefully the quality of the information was good. So. All right, guys. Happy Thursday. Bye.